our eyes are capable of perceiving the minutest shifts in value. Um, but when we have two strong colors next to each other, there's kind of a confusion that happens here, or even, even a strong color next to a gray. You look at it and your mind just feels confused because one of them isn't darker and you don't know what to do about that. <laughs> You are going to get some amazing color exercises today and meet an incredible artist. Please welcome Amy Erickson. Amy, welcome. Hi, Eric. Hi, everyone. Thanks You're for having so me. You're so chill. <laughs> everybody's uptight today. We're not going to talk about what's going on today, but everybody's uptight. I can no. I can say that, right? <laughs> no, well, not here in the garden shed. Everybody's everybody's relaxed. <laughs> All right, you're you're literally in a garden shed. I'm in a temporary studio because I'm staying with my parents right now. Oh, because of COVID. No, actually, my dad had an accident in March right before COVID. And oh, so no. then and I came down for that because, yeah, he was they thought he was on his deathbed. And so we all came oh, and no. um, turns out he's doing fine. He's recovered really well. But I do have this temporary studio in the very nice garden shed. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Terrific. Yeah. And where's home normally? Yeah. Portland, Oregon. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, oh. shout out P Town. Hey, P Town. All right. Well, there's a great <laughs> artist community in Portland. Fabulous community there. So, what are you going to yes, do today? That's true. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, um, I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about the painting behind me, which is in progress, and then okay. I'm going to show you some of my all time two of my all time favorite mixing exercises. Whoops. Um, to learn about color. Oh, good. Uh, yeah. We can all use a little color work. Terrific. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll bring you back in just a minute. Uh, you can get your camera set up, and and uh, we'll okay. be learning about color. Do you have any teasers that might help us understand what it's going to help us under, uh, help us grasp? Yes, we're gonna. I'm gonna do two imperfect color strings. One of them is going to be a value scale. And the other one, this is this is where the real beauty comes in. Is it's a it's a hue scale with no value change. Oh, that's gonna be fun. I know. Oh, good. All right, this is exciting. <laughs> well, we artists get excited about the craziest little things, don't we? I could look at these forever. I'm serious, Eric. A beautiful value scale, light to dark. It's just the most calming thing in the world. I I I love them. Oh, good. Well, we're looking forward to it. We've got an audience from all over the world today. I've been playing with watercolor a lot lately because I, I just can't, I just don't want to carry uh, paints everywhere I go. You know, for instance, I have a watercolor kit that I keep in my, in my uh, carry-on bag. And yeah. that way, because I don't, you know, if I'm traveling, I don't want to spend my evenings in a bar. Uh, so I'll sit in the hotel room and I'll set up a still life or I'll look out the window and I'll paint something out the window. And yeah. so I can't always carry oils. Uh, I, I don't want to carry oils on things like that. Or if I'm some, some trips to Europe or something, I might not take them. So I, uh, I've been studying watercolor a little bit more and, and everybody's got a different technique. It's not all the same. And so this is, I'm pretty yeah. excited about this actually. Yeah, that sounds great. I've done a lot of traveling with just a sketchbook and a pencil and the mini watercolor set. Yeah. It's really so practical. That's all you need really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one of those little tiny ones as well. It's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to yeah. let you get started because I want to make sure you get ample time. So I'm going to pull off screen, but I'll be here okay, okay. answering questions and uh, fielding comments. And we got people from all over the world watching you. Oh, great. So if no, there's comments, sure. like if people ask questions in, a, in the comment thread, are you going to pass them on to me? I, I will. Absolutely. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, good. Yeah. Cause I, I can't see that right now. Oh, I understand um, that, but I can. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so hi everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I have here a painting in progress and this is a, um, this is, this canvas is a painting that I, I was part of my senior project, um, in college how many years ago? Um, 
and is a portrait of my friend Jen, who has beautiful red hair, and her hand was right here, and it was vertical, and her face was right here, and I'm going to try to dig up a photo of that painting, because I didn't take one before I decided that it's its lifetime was drawn. So what you're clothes. saying is you, paint, you painted over an old college painting? That's right. I painted over it. Okay. And then I found out that everybody here loved that painting. Oh, no. <laughs> Whoops. I know. Well, Whoops. you know what? Onward, right? Onward. Um, onward. So, so this still life is entirely out of my head. Um, and I was just interested. It's for me, it's always fun to paint over an old painting or even a canvas that has anything on it because you start having more interesting relationships more quickly, accidental relationships. And um, it just gives you me a lot of opportunity to think about where points of interest are on the canvas. For example, like this is, this is where her hand, one of her hands was. And I just think I've always had this curiosity about, about composition, which um, is not my topic for today, but I am always curious about like where things go and, and also the shapes. Like, can you have the same basic composition and apply it to a still life or a, apply it to a maritime scene? Do you know what I mean? It's just this thing that I'm curious about. So anyway, I painted over it. And did, um, did you prime it first or, or did you paint right over what what was there i painted right over and not even all of it like this is the wallpaper and this is um this blue skirt she was wearing and this is the pillow she was sitting on this line was like the um chair rail and this painting over here was actually also in the painting oh cool yeah so that, like her head was here you know how skip lipke has that device where he he puts a painting on the wall behind the subject's head and it cr just creates an interesting, um, I loved Skip Lipke so much when I was in college. I mean, who doesn't, right? right. Anyway, that, that's where I got that idea. I didn't actually have that in the setup. Um, but so today I thought it would be fun to, to talk a little bit about values and, um, and non like value change and non-value change. So, All right. Like in this painting, for example, you can see that the light is very flat. Um, each object isn't defined primarily by light and shadow on the object. Like this blue picture is completely lit and it's casting a shadow up behind it. You can see that the highlight is in the center, more or less, of the object and that the shadow is going back behind it. And same thing with the teapot. There's, there's a little bit of value change here, but in general, it's lit with a highlight and the shadows going behind. So, um, so in that case, how do you show that the object has form if you're not gonna do it using a shadow shape? And what's happening here is that there's, um, there's not a, a value change from the center here where it's more lit to the edges but there is a chroma change so it gets grayer and it makes it feel like this um, picture is rounding out of the light Be this is effective because um as human beings and the way that we perceive color and it's also just a, a fact of color um color is a function of light hitting an object. So um, one way to think about that is the, the more light you have hitting the object, the more color you're gonna have in that part. So here we have light hitting it, so it's a brighter blue. And then as it turns off over here, it's, it's still lit and I didn't wanna do it with a value change, so I just did it with, we could call it a chroma change or we could call it a hue change, right? Because it gets a little bit more purpley, but also it drops in um, saturation as it moves right. over. Sa same thing here. You can see there's, with a white object, we do get a little bit of value change as it drops off. And then I have, still have room for my highlight in the middle. So, Somebody asked uh, real quickly, did you oil yeah. down the old portrait before you painted over it? No, I didn't. 
Um, and I didn't sand it or scrape it or anything. I just, and, and, and it's true that, you know, there is some relief on the old paint, but yeah, no, I just painted right over it. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. So you're, you're turning form with, without shadow, you're turning form going from high chroma to lower chroma and then a change in hue. Yes. All right. Yes. So would you, for the sake of the people who might be tuning in, who don't understand what those terms mean, would you explain them very quickly? Happily. This is one of my favorite subjects. Ah. <laughs> um, color has three defining characteristics, hue, value, and chroma. Hue is the color family, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, or purple, or any division between those, such as red, orange, or reddish, orange, or pinkish, orange, or, you know, orangey, yellow. So you can, you can divide it up, but generally those are, those are the broad categories and the broadest categories are red, yellow, blue. Um, value is how light or dark it is. So light, dark right? Middle. That's the value. And then chroma is um, synonymous with saturation. So like fire engine red is, is a high chroma red. And brick red is also red, but it's not a bright red like fire engine. Or another example would be like dandy, dandelion yellow is a high chroma yellow. Um, Dijon mustard low chroma still yellow yeah but it's not and, and i think sometimes people get confused about light because they think some that, that chroma is lighter but it's not it can be right and and the word when we use the word bright it usually is referring to chroma or to chroma and value when we say some like a bright yellow it's usually high chroma and high value right um, so, but it's not as clear as saying that it's high chroma and high value. So I think it's really useful to adopt the most specific terms that we have, um, because it helps us think differently about color. Um, I also believe that it's, it's important not to lose our poetic descriptions of color, like a beautiful silvery, dewy, pinkish, purpley blue. Yeah, that's, that's fine was... too. Yeah, we yeah. need that too, right? Because as artists, we we don't want to turn, we don't want to be only scientific about things. We right. need both. Yeah, I like it. Well, we have mm -hmm. Ireland, we have Costa Rica, Guatemala, uh, Netherlands, Italy, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Thanks Egypt. for tuning in, you guys. Wow, so man. fun. We have people in the kitchen in my house. <laughs> cool, cool. They're watching. <laughs> yep. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. <laughs> right, exactly. They love that. Um, so I'm going to start out by doing a little um, value scale, and I'll just adjust my camera a tiny bit so you can see. I'm using the Openbox M um, palette and panel holder, which um, I like it for painting, and I also really like it for teaching because it has my palette up here where everybody can see it. Right, you can spread it out. Yeah. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is a, a little value scale here. And I, I, when I do these color exercises in um, any time for myself or in class, I think that it is a really nice approach to say, let's just make an imperfect one. Instead of doing it perfectly, let's just make one and see what we can see. So this is going to be a scale that goes from very light. This is pure white. And I'm going to do the entire exercise with a knife because it's faster. I just, I just wipe it off and then I can go on to my next color without it being um, contaminated. So here's my darkest color. And this is a nice mixture that I made this morning out of some leftover paint. It's got some Venetian red and some total waste of cobalt teal. One of the things that people don't understand is some of the best blacks are not coming out of a tube. Well, yeah, it's true because, you know, 
in a painting, it, it, it's really, what you want to build is color relationships. And anytime you take something right out of the tube, it is unrelated to any other color in your painting. So by intermixing things, you get related color and that's where we achieve harmony. Um, so I've mixed up a, a starting point gray, which there's, there's a really useful test that I do and I, I've done it over here. The, the lighting here is a little bit less than optimal, so you can't see the, it the way I see it. But what I do is I put my white and my quote unquote black, and then I put this gray in between. <clears throat> and this is just a little seeing exercise to allow us to expand our vision. Um, when, I, when I close up the gap between the dark and the mid-tone gray, and then I close up the gap between the white and the mid-tone gray, I can really clearly see this relationship, which I'm sorry, it doesn't really show on the camera. And I can really clearly see that relationship. So it allows me to look at the interval. I can actually compare this interval to this interval. And looking at it right now, to me, it's very clear that this interval is closer than that interval. So this gray that I've made is going to land around about here. It's closer to white. And then from there, I'm just going to mix it up a little lighter. And I can have as many steps as I want, right? Because you're the artist. That's right. So if I want to make it super complicated or if I'm if I'm in one of those um, college level color theory classes, I can do, you know, like a 50 value scale and, you know, require that it be perfect. Here's my next one. So now I'm just going on my palette. You can see I'm going from this one towards the white and I'm just gonna keep using this particular pile and adding white to it because I don't wanna exit the range. You have some Portland buddies watching. Do I? Yep. Hi, you guys. <laughs> oh, that's great. So here's a little lighter. And I want another step between here and here. So I'm just gonna make one. This is what I was saying, how it doesn't have to be perfect. You can add stuff wherever you want it. A lot of times, you know, if, if we're trying to do it perfectly, we'll end up with, you know, what do we do? Move everything over? No, we don't have to right. move everything over. We'll just add one right here. This, by the way, is a very important exercise for anybody learning to try right Messed hello sydney up. australia welcome oh sydney yeah greetings um okay so now i'm gonna go the other way i have this gray and i'm gonna start leaning it this way and i'm gonna start by i already i already put my dark down so i'm gonna add like seven molecules of my <laughs> gray mixture to this because I don't know how fast it's going to lean. Oh, that barely made any difference. I can okay, see it. So can you see can? It. Yeah. Okay. So then if you can see it, Eric, then I'm going to put it up here because often when I do this, I, I can't see the difference until I lay it right down next to the other one. Yeah, I still can't see that. But I'll take a little bit more of this and mix it in. 12 molecules this time. That's right. <laughs> the big leap. And now sometimes when you do the three molecule addition, you it, it shows a lot, like certain pigments. And this is how we understand tinting strength, right? Oh, so that's starting to show, for me anyway. It's, it's not a huge, like I, I perceive it mostly as a shift in feeling, like it's a tiny bit lighter, but it feels more opaque. So now I'm just gonna keep going. Another 30 molecules. And and as I add these together, I'm, I'm eyeballing this one, right? Like you can see that I still have quite a ways to go before I hit that middle value, right? Like I'm here. 
I got a ways to go. So I will just keep going. For me, it, it, I consider it really important to have, have them touching completely. Otherwise, you, I can't really see the relationship between those two mixes. Well, everything's about relationships and the, the color of the palette yeah. or the underpainting will influence if you have a gap in between. That's right. So here I'm going to do one with a gap. So we can see that a little bit, but when I close up the gap, you can see that then we can really see. Yeah, hard to tell on camera. Oh, is it? Okay, I'm gonna move but, a little faster here so I can. What we'll do is once you get through it, then maybe we'll take the camera and do a, hold it up and do a close up or something so they can see. Oh, sure. Yes, we can definitely do that. I'm just gonna keep going. Marilyn says, great to see Amy Erickson. You were one of my favorite artists watching from Boca Raton, oh, Florida. Wow. wow, thank you, Marilyn. That's so nice. People are so nice. I used to do um, work in elementary schools. Oh, cool. Yeah, and in the elementary schools, like they encourage and you know teach the children to be positive and encouraging of their peers. So as the guest guest artist in the school, they were always very positive and encouraging to me. And like, so I'd be working on something, and a class would walk by, and the kids would just be so enthusiastic. You're really good. You're the best artist in the school. Thank you, artist. I love what you're doing. Like, just like over the top enthusiastic. And like, I swear, it's a good feeling. What a great, what a great thing to train kids to do. Yeah, that's nice. All right, now you can see I have a huge skip and I'm just gonna go straight to it. The little bit that I have left in my pile and see if I can just bridge that gap. Good thing I'm doing an imperfect one and not a flawless one. Now you can see that like I could start adding white into this mixture, but then it's possible that I would pass this one, right? So just a little value control test. There we go. Nancy, uh Atherton West says it's just like the Dreamliner way. Dreamliner is the group that created from watching these daily, and it's all about being positive oh, and encouraging. That's great. So thank you for that, Nancy. That's right. Thank you, Nancy. That's well, great. we have Zacatecas, Mexico. I probably botched the name. Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, so there we Heck, have... they're making pancakes in Paget in, in in for lunch, pancakes in Quebec. <laughs> wow. So here's my value scale. All right. It's not perfect. Like you can see that these kind of group together and these kind of group together. So anytime, like anytime you see something like this, it's an opportunity to just appreciate what you can perceive. Cause if you can't perceive something, then you can't make a decision about it. Um, but you know, seeing this, I could I could choose to just remove this whole section if I wanted to and remix it and spread out these values a little bit. So however, that is not my aim well, this I, morning. I'm gonna so go my, to my instructor when I first learned this is this is something he made us do. And it's kind of like learning the keys on the keyboard. It's it's so essentially important. I know it's even called scales. Yeah. <laughs> Never thought about I know. that. Uh, I know. Okay. So um, the next one I'm going to do um, is so the color question, one. A question. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Marty says, yeah. I'm sure Amy will get to this, but how do you relate doing value scales when you are actually painting and how do you see value and how do you push them? Well, I think I think that that's a really 
a really good question. Um, I think the best way to understand value when you're painting is to do value paintings, just like mix up some values and work in work without color. Yep. And you, you, you'll learn so much that way. And another, another really, really, really good way to understand value is to force yourself to work in two or three value compositions in a very um, academic, um, very limited way. And by that, I mean like you could take like a, um, a reference photo um, and do a, an overlay tracing and force the shapes into light, middle, or dark. Um, I actually am, I, I have this on my mind right now because we, we use this a lot in college and um, I'm gonna be teaching a class. Um, oh, it's a, it's a one day, it's a, like a technique demo on rub out. And in rub out, you have to be very clear about establishing a two or three value structure for your painting. Oh, so can you so tell this, people what rub out is? Yeah, rub out is when you, um, you, it's a subtractive painting process where you cover the canvas in a single color and then you use various tools to pull the paint off and reveal the canvas beneath to establish your lights. Mm -hmm. And it was established really by Bernie Fuchs who took it to a level that I, has never been met by anyone. Um, but I'm gonna make a, a stab at it because it's a very, very useful approach for understanding um, two or three value compositions and also for a great way to start a painting like you, you can either use rub out as a way to do a painting start to finish, or you can use it as the foundation for a painting that you're going to. So do you have, paint. do you have, um, uh, could you take a little two inch square, four inch square on your canvas up there, lay down some, some of your dark, and then just do a quick example of a rub out. I think if people saw it, they would appreciate it. Yeah. My, I'll use my, this. Oh, I'll, I'll use this one because like this Perfect. is already toned. So right. yeah, I know if I've, my instructor told me to do that the very first day that, yeah. that he started teaching me. So here, let's say so. And I am I do have a full demo of this prepared and you can register for it at Winslow Art Center. Okay. But say I did this whole thing dark like this. Then and again, you can use a variety of tools. I'm just gonna dip a brush in a little bit of turpentine and I can pick out the lights, right? So, oh, I'll do one, I'll do a little face. Face has eye sockets. Mm -hmm. And so you can see, oh, it's going to be slightly skeletal. And fill out the cheeks. The beauty of this is that you realize, you, you start thinking about, oh, wow, I can do so much less than I thought I had to do to establish imagery in a painting. Kind of a sad looking face, but that's okay. And there we go. A lot of light on the forehead. There we go. So there's a little rub out face. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think that I think that'll be helpful for people. Great. Yeah. Okay. So now, now we're going to do the hue, hue scale without a value change. And I've done a little prep on my um, palette already, as you can see. I have one out of the tube color. <laughs> which um, is an extravagant use of um, Old Holland's Cinnabar Green Light Extra. That's this color. 
it's gorgeous. So I'm gonna put that up here as this end. It's this beautiful yellowy green. Max Ginsburg used the cinnabar green in uh, to gray down other parts of his portraits. That's right. That's right. Because it's um, complementary to most orangey flesh tones, right? Right. That might be why I have it. Okay. Okay. So then, clean. Oh, this is already contaminated. All right. So we're gonna see. So this is. And this one is the Gamblin Quinacridone Violet, and I have made a tint. I just mixed it with white, and I'm trying to get these two to be the same value. So I'm going to do a little test up here and just put them right side by side. If you squint down, they're pretty close. Yeah, you know, I think that's going to be good enough for government work. Yep. It's <laughs> difficult. It's, this is a very, very interesting thing because you will find the limit of what you can perceive. Like, especially with high chroma colors, it, the color is so strong that it becomes difficult to perceive the value. So what you can always do if you're not sure is just bracket. Like if I take this color and make it a little bit darker, say I think that one's a little too light. Here it is a tiny bit darker. And then I'll lay this one up here next to the green and see how I like it. And that to me is clearly darker. I don't yeah. know if it shows as much for you guys. Yeah, it does. It does. If you okay, squint good. out, it's definitely darker. And if I still wasn't sure, I would make a lighter one too. But when I look at this, something happens on that edge, like here where we where the where the um, the interval shows. Um, clearly as a value shift, it's very easy for us to perceive. Um, our eyes are capable of perceiving the minutest shifts in value. Um, but when we have two strong colors next to each other, there's kind of a confusion that happens here, or even, even a strong color next to a gray. You look at it and your mind just feels confused because one of them isn't darker and you don't know what to do about that. So this bracketing exercise is good to help you figure out just to see more, right? If, you're, yep. if your brain needs more information, you wanna drum up more information. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and use this one. So here it is at this end of my scale. Now my goal is to get from here to there Oh boy. In, yeah, <laughs> I know. It's so fun. But, and I will say the beautiful, you can do this with any two colors. You could do it um, like from blue to gray like that. You could do it from uh, any, anything to anything and you'll get different stuff in between. If the two original colors are more analogous, then you'll just get a beautiful high chroma shift. Like if you're going from say phthalo green that's tinted. Um, I, I like to do these in the higher value ranges. Mm -hmm. So you're going from, say I was going from phthalo green to um, cobalt teal. Then you could see that it would be a beautiful shift, but it would stay all in the greens and blues, right? Between those two. So here we're gonna get some interesting thing between yellowy green and pinkish purple. Well, you got about 12 minutes to pull it off. Thank you, Eric. That is good to know. I will do it. Okay, so I'm going to use, I might do fewer than I usually do, but I will show you my technique because okay. this, I, I do feel that this particular approach to this is very useful. I'm not, I don't think I'll need all of this. So what I do is, um, I don't need, I'm, I'll use all my green. I don't need any more pure cinnabar green because I put it up there. So now I will take my two molecules of my other mixture and I'll put it in here, aid it right up. So because I know I need to move it a little quicker, I'll put a little bit more in there. And I, I skipped my sort of intermediate 
one. Uh, this is how I more commonly do it is just go start working in from either end. Okay, so I can't really tell as usual, but I'll put it right here and see if I can tell. Yeah, it's so slight. This is how I like to do it though, because when you're working on a painting, sometimes that much of a color difference is exactly what you need. Right, to turn form. And this, yeah, or, or, to, or to create a focal point, it might need to be that much brighter than the rest of it. I'm just gonna move it a little quicker. So this cinnabar green is quite strong. I'm used to having the quinacridone be one of the well, strongest things. Old Holland things. is a very high pigment pigment strength. That's true. Okay, so here we go. This should be visible. There we go. It's visible to me. It's starting to get richer. This is what I normally see, is that when you're mixing two colors together, the original ones start to feel really raw. Um, they, they don't, because the, the color is just so pure. All right, so now I'm gonna start from the other end, take a little bit of this and bring this whole mixture with me. I'm, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it a little bigger interval than I normally do, just so it'll be more visible on camera. There we go. And it looks yellower. I think it's really fun to have um, some exercises like this up your sleeve so that um, if you have studio time and you, you're not feeling particularly inspired or you don't have something underway or you have something underway and you don't know what to do with on it, you have a, a, an activity you can enjoy that will also expand your understanding of paint and color. Here we go. There, now you can see that start to move, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. So as long as I'm mixing between these two, I'm not gonna end up going, you know, pinker as I try to go this way. That's what I want. I want it to get continually greener. So now I'm gonna take some of this and mix it into this one. Every time I do this exercise, I, I try it with different colors because I, it's fun. It's, and I get to see more interaction between color. And for me, it's, it's not a direct line. It's not like, okay, I'm gonna remember how I made that specific color so that I can put it on a leaf right here. You know, it's, that's not really how it works for me. I, I just, I just accumulate all the knowledge that I can. And then in the moment, I make a decision that feels right to me. So if you were painting something like your vase in the background, would you pre-mix these like you're doing or would you in, put piles or would you just kind of do it instinctively? I, it, it depends on how big I'm working. Um, if I'm working really big, I will do more pre-mixing, but in general, I, I work, um, I just mix with my brush and let it happen as I go a little greener. See, I'm getting closer together. Yep. Oh, it's so pretty. Oh, it's so pretty. It is. It, like, I just, oh. I'm gonna finish this up. Well, and you really are seeing the, the beautiful color variations that you can create, too. Yeah. Those look there identical. Go, greener. Here to here? Or these two? Yeah, well, yeah. I guess it's a little green. It's hard to tell on camera. Right but we'll be able to tell when we get them closed up, which, you know what, let's just make a big one and close it up. I'll just mix together my remaining two, which I know will put me right in the middle. And it makes this nice green, which is gonna be a wide one. Um, that makes sense, doesn't it? 
There we go. All right. So there, those are nice intervals and oh yes. Okay, we have a little bit of glare. Hang on, I'll change this. And Oh, that really Let's helps. See. I'm trying to do it without without glare. Here we go. So we're starting from bright pink. Oh, yeah. Woo. Ooh. Yay. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> that is beautiful. Oh, and then there they are together at the end, right next to each other with no transition colors in between. And here they are with all their transition colors and a little bit of glare. So sign it and frame it gorgeous right yeah yeah i love doing them so you can really see how that that works especially when you're trying to create something that is less less chromatic less colorful as the as the vase turns for instance yes absolutely and and the other thing about it too is it teaches you a greater sensitivity to shifts in color um a lot of times when you're painting you think oh i need this to be a little bit pinker and you'll just scoop up some pink and it ends up being much pinker than you need it to be. So, you know, doing these exercises, you, you just start to really see how little changes and, and, and you learn the different pigments, how strong their tinting strengths are, how different pigments interact with one another. And um, it, you just, you, when you know more, you paint, your knowledge informs your painting. Absolutely. <clears throat> I've never seen that done. I have a, I have a, um, quite a few similar to these that I give my students when we do workshops. Um, usually the first morning is spent in some sort of color mixing exercise, just because, um, there, everybody can be successful at them. It's completely within your comprehension. Um, and you, you get a beautiful, successful outcome that taught you something. So, well, I, I knew the concept, but I had never actually seen somebody do the scale like that. And it's fabulous. I'm going to play with that. That sounds like fun. And uh, you can great. put them in your sketchbook too. If you do it just with a smaller knife, you can just go across in your sketchbook, and then you'll have all these different um, color color scales right in your sketchbook which is fun. Now, do you make color charts as well? Do you take your full palette and make full color charts? I don't, I don't do it with my full palette. Um, one of the other exercises that I frequently give students is a small value and um, <clears throat> color chart where we'll do on, on the one side, we'll do a little, say we'll do a value scale like this, but maybe only four values. So like gray, 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 four of them. And then as we make the other columns, this is not a good visual for what I'm explaining, but as you make the other columns in the chart, um, you can put whatever color you want in that row, as long as it's the same value. So you're essentially, you know, thinking about color, yeah. but matching it to the value that you already determined. Cool. Yeah. That's fabulous. That's Thank really you for fun. that. I, uh, You're welcome. Again, I, I knew concept, but I never had seen it done in this way. It was, it's really nice to see that. Yeah. And, and I would encourage everybody to try it. It'll be fun. Yeah. I will. I just will add that the funny thing is most people think, oh, charts. <sighs> but I mean, to a person, everyone who has done these is delighted. Well, they're freeing, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and especially because now you can look at that and you can, if you had a string of those <clears throat> with a lot of different colors, you can look at that and say, how do I get that color? Well, you know exactly. Yeah. And and if you had, if you had picked one of those colors in the middle, I'm not so sure I would have picked those, the cinnabar green and the quinacridone uh, red <clears throat> mixed in to uh, to create it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, they're so beautiful. Yeah. Amy is Little absorbed shirts. in the colors. 
I am easily distracted <laughs> by color charts. Oh, look at all the pretty colors, man. <laughs> but Eric's really, I just want to thank you and everyone who is watching this. Uh, honestly, this is one of, this is a great joy in my life. And it, I am so pleased to be able to share with you something that it has, that has meant so much to me. Well, you brought some great joy to our life today. Thank you for that, thank Amy. You. Thank you, Eric. So you've got a workshop coming up where? I do. I have, so I have a one day um, or like one hour maybe um, <laughs> tech, technique workshop coming up yeah. with uh -huh. Winslow Art Center and that's the rub out one. Okay. And then I'm all, but be, that's in January, but also starting next week, I have a couple of um online backlit still life classes also through um winslow art center and in february i am going to be teaching directly um this is not quite on my website yet but almost i'm going to be teaching a color value and still life class online oh outstanding Terrific. Yeah, so you can watch well, for that on my website. And anybody who wants updates, just um, join the mailing list and you'll get them. All right. And it's spelled A-I-M-E-E, -E, Amy Erickson com. Yes. But if you so type in A-M-Y Erickson, I own that one too. So it'll take you there. Just in case people get yeah. it. Wrong. All right. It happens. <laughs> You'd be surprised. I get it. <laughs> well, Amy, thank you. This has been an absolute delight. And I uh, really you, appreciate Eric. you coming on today. And, and, uh, you know, it's what what amazes me is that now 223 days in a row, different artists can every single day I learn something new that I didn't know, and mm -hmm. thought I knew a lot. So you you've uh, you've checked a box for me. You've got something mm -hmm. new for me. Thank you very much. 